In the Shadow of the Holocaust By Masha Gessen Please support her financially were feasible. Berlin never stops reminding you of what happened there. Several museums examine totalitarianism and the Holocaust. The memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe takes up an entire city block. In a sense, though, these larger structures are the least of it. The memorials that sneak up on you, the monument to burned books, which is literally underground, and the thousands of Stolperstein, or stumbling stones, built into sidewalks to commemorate individual Jews, Sinti, Roma, homosexuals, mentally ill people, and others murdered by the Nazis, reveal the pervasiveness of the evils once committed in this place. In early November, when I was walking to a friend's house in the city, I happened upon the information stand that marks the site of Hitler's bunker. I had done so many times before. It looks like a neighborhood bulletin board, but it tells the story of the Fuhrer's final days. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, when many of these memorials were conceived and installed, I visited Berlin often. It was exhilarating to watch memory culture take shape. Here was a country, or at least a city, that was doing what most cultures cannot, looking at its own crimes, its own worst self. But at some point, the effort began to feel static, glassed in, as though it were an effort not only to remember history, but also to ensure that only this particular history is remembered, and only in this way. This is true in the physical, visual sense. Many of the memorials use glass, the Reichstag, a building nearly destroyed during the Nazi era and rebuilt half a century later, is now topped by a glass dome. The Burned Books Memorial lives under glass. Glass partitions and glass panes put order to the stunning, once haphazard collection called Topography of Terror. As Candice Brights, a South African Jewish artist who lives in Berlin, told me, the good intentions that came into play in the 1980s have too often solidified into dogma. Among the few spaces where memory representation is not set in apparent permanence are a couple of the galleries in the new building of the Jewish Museum, which was completed in 1999. When I visited in early November, a gallery on the ground floor was showing a video installation called Rehearsing the Spectacle of Spectres. The video was set in Kibbutz Be'eri, the community where, on October 7th, Hamas killed more than 90 people, almost one in ten residents, during its attack on Israel, which ultimately claimed more than 1,200 lives. In the video, Ba'eri residents take turns reciting the lines of a poem by one of the community's members, the poet Anadad Eldon Frado. From the swamp between the ribs, she surfaced who had submerged in you, and you are constrained not shouting hunting for the forms that scamper outside. The video, by the Berlin-based Israeli artists Nir Evron and Omar Krieger, was completed nine years ago. It begins with an aerial view of the area, the Gaza Strip visible, then slowly zooms in on the houses of the kibbutz, some of which looked like bunkers. I am not sure what the artists and the poet had initially meant to convey, now the installation looked like a work of mourning for Be'eri. Eldon, who is nearly a hundred years old, survived the Hamas attack. Down the hallway was one of the spaces that the architect Daniel Libeskind, who designed the museum, called Voids. Shafts of air that pierce the building, symbolizing the absence of Jews in Germany through generations. There, an installation by the Israeli artist Menashe Kadishman, titled Fallen Leaves, consists of more than 10,000 rounds of iron, with eyes and mouths cut into them, like casts of children's drawings of screaming faces. When you walk on the faces, they clank, like shackles, or like the bolt handle of a rifle. Kaddishman dedicated the work to victims of the Holocaust and other innocent victims of war and violence. I don't know what Kaddishman, who died in 2015, would have said about the current conflict. But, after I walked from the haunting video of Kibbutz Be'eri to the clanking iron faces, I thought of the thousands of residents of Gaza killed in retaliation for the lives of Jews killed by Hamas. Then I thought that, 
if I were to state this publicly in Germany, I might get in trouble. On November 9th, to mark the 85th anniversary of Kristallnacht, a star of David and the phrase, Nie wieder ist jetzt, never again is now, was projected in white and blue on Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. That day, the Bundestag was considering a proposal titled Fulfilling Historical Responsibility, Protecting Jewish Life in Germany, which contained more than 50 measures intended to combat anti-Semitism in Germany, including deporting immigrants who commit anti-Semitic crimes, stepping up activities directed against the boycott, divestment and sanctions BDS movement, supporting Jewish artists whose work is critical of anti-Semitism, implementing a particular definition of anti-Semitism in funding and policing decisions, and beefing up cooperation between the German and the Israeli armed forces. In earlier remarks, the German Vice-Chancellor, Robert Habeck, who is a member of the Green Party, said that Muslims in Germany should clearly distance themselves from anti-Semitism so as not to undermine their own right to tolerance. Germany has long regulated the ways in which the Holocaust is remembered and discussed. In 2008, when then-Chancellor Angela Merkel spoke before the Knesset on the 60th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel, she emphasized Germany's special responsibility not only for preserving the memory of the Holocaust as a unique historical atrocity, but also for the security of Israel. This, she went on, was part of Germany's Staatsraison, the reason for the existence of the state. The sentiment has since been repeated in Germany seemingly every time the topic of Israel, Jews, or anti-Semitism arises, including in Habeck's remarks. The phrase Israel's security is part of Germany's Staatsraison has never been an empty phrase, he said, and it must not become one. At the same time, an obscure yet strangely consequential debate on what constitutes anti-Semitism has taken place. In 2016, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IHRA, an intergovernmental organization, adopted the following definition. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. This definition was accompanied by 11 examples, which began with the obvious, calling for or justifying the killing of Jews, but also included. Claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavour. And. Drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. This definition had no legal force, but it has had extraordinary influence. 25 EU member states and the U.S. State Department have endorsed or adopted the IHRA definition. In 2019, President Donald Trump signed an executive order providing for the withholding of federal funds from colleges where students are not protected from anti-Semitism as defined by the IHRA. On December 5th of this year, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a non-binding resolution condemning anti-Semitism, as defined by the IHRA. It was proposed by two Jewish Republican representatives and opposed by several prominent Jewish Democrats, including New York's Jerry Nadler. In 2020, a group of academics proposed an alternative definition of anti-Semitism, which they called the Jerusalem Declaration. It defines anti-Semitism as discrimination, prejudice, hostility, or violence against Jews as Jews or Jewish institutions as Jewish, and provides examples that help distinguish anti-Israel statements and actions from anti-Semitic ones. But although some of the pre-eminent scholars of the Holocaust participated in drafting the Declaration, it has barely made a dent in the growing influence of the IHRA definition. In 2021, the European Commission published a handbook for the practical use of the IHRA definition, 
which recommended, among other things, using the definition in training law enforcement officers to recognize hate crimes and creating the position of state attorney or coordinator or commissioner for anti-Semitism. Germany had already implemented this particular recommendation. In 2018, the country created the Office of the Federal Government Commissioner for Jewish Life in Germany and the Fight Against Antisemitism, a vast bureaucracy that includes commissioners at the state and local level, some of whom work out of prosecutors' offices or police precincts. Since then, Germany has reported an almost uninterrupted rise in the number of anti-Semitic incidents. More than 2,000 in 2019, more than 3,000 in 2021, and, according to one monitoring group, a shocking 994 incidents in the month following the Hamas attack. But the statistics mix what Germans call Israel Bezogener Antisemitismus, Israel-related antisemitism, such as instances of criticism of Israeli government policies, with violent attacks, such as an attempted shooting at a synagogue in Halle in 2019, which killed two bystanders, shots fired at a former rabbi's house in Essen in 2022, and two Molotov cocktails thrown at a Berlin synagogue this fall. The number of incidents involving violence has, in fact, remained relatively steady and has not increased following the Hamas attack. There are now dozens of anti-Semitism commissioners throughout Germany. They have no single job description or legal framework for their work, but much of it appears to consist of publicly shaming those they see as anti-Semitic, often for desingularizing the Holocaust or for criticizing Israel. Hardly any of these commissioners are Jewish. Indeed, the proportion of Jews among their targets is certainly higher. These have included the German-Israeli sociologist Moshe Zuckerman, who was targeted for supporting the BDS movement, as was the South African Jewish photographer Adam Broomberg. In 2019, the Bundestag passed a resolution condemning BDS as anti-Semitic and recommending that state funding be withheld from events and institutions connected to BDS. The history of the resolution is telling. A version was originally introduced by the AFD, the radical right ethno-nationalist and Eurosceptic party, then relatively new to the German parliament. Mainstream politicians rejected the resolution because it came from the AFD, but apparently fearful of being seen as failing to fight anti-Semitism, immediately introduced a similar one of their own. The resolution was unbeatable because it linked BDS to the most terrible phase of German history. For the AFD, whose leaders have made openly anti-Semitic statements and endorsed the revival of Nazi-era nationalist language, the spectre of anti-Semitism is a perfect, cynically wielded political instrument, both a ticket to the political mainstream and a weapon that can be used against Muslim immigrants. The BDS movement, which is inspired by the boycott movement against South African apartheid, seeks to use economic pressure to secure equal rights for Palestinians in Israel and the occupation and promote the return of Palestinian refugees. Many people find the BDS movement problematic because it doesn't affirm the right of the Israeli state to exist, and indeed, some BDS supporters envision a total undoing of the Zionist project. Still, one could argue that associating a non-violent boycott movement whose supporters have explicitly positioned it as an alternative to armed struggle with the Holocaust is the very definition of Holocaust relativism. But, according to the logic of German memory policy, because BDS is directed against Jews, although many of the movement's supporters are also Jewish, it is anti-Semitic. One could also argue that the inherent conflation of Jews with the State of Israel is anti-Semitic, even that it meets the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And given the AFD's involvement and the pattern of the resolution being used largely against Jews and people of color, one might think that this argument would gain traction. One would be wrong.